Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Gotham City Podcast. I'm your host, Levy Rosman. In this podcast, I talk to people who live in the chess world on the 64 squares and at times beyond them. For this episode, we are traveling beyond them, as I am having a conversation with Tirzu. Tirzu, also known as Patch, is an OG on YouTube. He puts out fascinating content that he works tirelessly on. I highly, highly recommend his channel. Uh, I've been watching him for many years. And he was one of the first people to collab with me as chess started booming in early 2020. I've got a video up on my YouTube channel with him uh, from the earliest days of my content when there was nothing in my background. The camera quality was bad, the microphone quality was bad, and yet the content delivered and many people enjoyed that beginner chess lesson. We've kept in touch since. Uh, we've met in person as well here in New York when he came to visit. He's a great guy and we recorded this episode back in October actually. So. I've been very bad at putting out these episodes. It's been tough for me to manage three channels at once, as well as working on a handful of other projects. I do hope to be a little bit more diligent. This is currently the last episode that I've got filmed and probably will be for a little while uh, while I work on some of my other projects, as I mentioned, but I hope you enjoy our conversation. Do you remember the story? Like, did I ever tell you the story of discovering your content? I mean, I'm sure you've had people tell you they're discovering your content story. Uh, but did I ever tell you my discovering your content story? No, I guess not. I All I remember is you kind of just uh, DM me on Twitter and was like, hey, I heard you're into chess. Do you want to learn? Um, but I, I, I didn't get the prequel to that, I guess. <laughs> so please do tell. Yeah, because I just realized, man, that, that feels like lifetimes ago, by the way. That, that know, video. Yeah. It's that a whole pandemic ago, though, so I know that is I a know. lifetime. It it really does feel like a whole lifetime ago. Um, yeah, that's I I don't even I didn't even realize that was exactly how we got in touch. I I guess looking back, I should have I should have uh, re like I should have probably remembered that that there there had to have been a way I got in touch. But yeah, I remember somebody was like, "Oh yeah, Tierzu is like playing some chess." I was like, "Oh, Tierzu." Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll send him a message because I was I was an absolute nobody back in I don't know what was that March April twenty twenty maybe that was like May June already but uh, oh yeah like I'll I'll teach you chess no problem I mean uh, I had already seen a few of your videos at that point so that's wild you, were, you you saw the raw unfiltered I uh, suppose I did I got the real <laughs> the season zero Levy Roswood um, you ever look back at your old videos and you're like what was I doing or are you proud oh, of everything no I'm time. not proud of everything there's so much in the the archives well i they're all still up i haven't taken anything down so yeah maybe for not, sure but um yeah there's a lot that i'm like wow i really just like didn't record i didn't re-record that line or something like i just left this mistake in because i was too lazy to fix it or whatever like all this stuff i'm like what was i doing this yeah. is my legacy and i'm just <laughs> letting mistakes be there i don't know no that's like especially for chess it's little little moments i say oh i could have explained something better i totally left this part out or i've, I've had videos that just record and upload and five minutes later I, I say oh my god i i was gonna mention this one thing just like integral to the video of course and i just yeah. didn't mention it at this point now i have like a whole people i send it to like hey check this check this this and this thing like make sure the sound sounds good make sure there's no wonky visuals or whatever and so yeah, I try to avoid those now, but it's still stuff still slips through, of course. Well, but anyway, so your your origin story of discovering me. Yeah, yeah. I was in a chess tournament, shocking, and I was rooming yeah. with my friend. And that whole story in and of itself is hilarious. We went to Montreal and we got an Airbnb, and it was a guy who was a student who left for the summer. And this guy like didn't put the keys in the right place. He said, My neighbor has my keys. She knows that people are gonna check into the Airbnb. And we went to her and she thought we were robbing her house. Whoa. She was threatening to call the cops. So we had to, in, we had our friend come who was helping organize the tournament. And in, in French, he had to explain who we were. And this place had zero amenities, no towels, nothing, like no soap. Just, there was just nothing, no bed sheets. Uh, and uh, yeah, we were just hanging out there for a few days playing this tournament. And my friend's like, oh, have you seen this video? This guy, you know, he made a cat tier list. Oh wow, was... that is ancient. <laughs> That's old. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's not your first video, is it? It's, but it's. It was the first one that like really blew up, blew up, and got a lot of views. But yeah, it's it's like my seventh or eighth video. Yeah, yeah, and I remember watching like, ah, oh, this is fun. Damn, like jaguars and cheetahs and stuff. I'm like, ah, oh, this is this is cool. I was watching, and then I just over the years would just come back to a video. I've never been 
like super diehard on YouTube or like particularly kind of always watching one individual. I just go here and there when I'm bored and I, and I watch your videos over time. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my origin story. And then back in 2020 when chess was still like this blip on the map and okay, we were first developing our wave, but there was no Queen's Gambit. I mean, I just looked at people like yourself and other creators like, yo, these are like gods. Like these are, uh, they are untouchable humans. This is so crazy. You know, they're playing chess. Wow. Uh, but apparently you've, you've played chess and also you're like, you're all normal people for the That's most true. part. So in your <laughs> case, yes. So, uh, it's supposed to kind of be a chess podcast. So I, I just remind me what your, this is the only really chess thing we have to get into, but remind me kind of your chess background and how you've been playing since the pandemic. Sure. Of course. So I guess my background is that, um, my father taught me a reasonable amount of chess. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was a child, like taught me enough to know like scholars made it's, it's about as far as we got uh, where I could, you know, steamroll everyone in the second grade within a few moves and no one could touch me. And it was great. Um, but that's about where that plateau, you know, I play anyone who's remotely competent and they're like, no, easy counter to that strategy. GG. Um, so that's that's about where that capped off until I got to college and I had a few friends who were um quite a bit more competent at the game and they would destroy me and then I would kind of you know study up a little bit practice a bit try to go back and forth play them a bit um and that's about where it kind of ended uh, I didn't really get too into it beyond that I had one friend who was very into chess.com um and he would destroy me all the time he told me later on that he was cheating actually so I feel a little bit less bad uh, what oh yeah my. is he, he still your friend imagine. yeah he was at the time he was like very very prideful about it um he was like I, I beat him like over the board and he was like this can never happen again and he would only play me online and he would always destroy me and I was like dang he really improved okay you got me well done uh <laughs> like a few years later he's like oh yeah that was all fake I was like oh okay um <laughs> <laughs> wow I hope you haven't like opened a business together oh my god no 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 <laughs> Wow. Um, I feel like that's actually a pretty common story. I feel like it's it, it's not so uncommon for people who know each other to start playing chess and then just it's it's really it's pretty easy to cheat. It's pretty easy to get caught too, but yeah. Especially but uh Yeah, I never even I never, never even considered that he might be cheating. But yeah, it was just kind of a little side hobby. It was nothing I ever took too seriously. Um that is up until I uh joined this sort of chess boom for the content creators I saw on Twitch everyone was playing chess and I'm like oh like I remember that game I play, I, I'm pretty okay at that one I'll try it out again um, and so I did a little bit of streaming on chess um, using chess.com and I didn't think it went very well but people seemed to at least like the stream my streams did better than any of the other streams I had really done I think um, which I didn't really love because it was more stressful to stream chess than anything else. Um, yep. but, <laughs> but at that point, I think that's when you came into the picture uh, and contacted me and offered to coach me a little bit, show me the, the fried liver, which I still, well, I don't know if I could quite say I still remember. I think I do, but I haven't tried it in a while. Um, so yeah, that's about where that story kind of ends. I think I streamed a little bit more um that the streams continue to do well but i just really did like streaming it i don't know how you do it man because like when i'm when i'm streaming chess uh it is like chat is just merciless it's it's so frustrating you'll yeah. like make a move or be about to make a move and chat will blow up like no not that it's mm -hmm. obvious how could you and like okay i don't know yeah so the, the pressure is is very high constantly yeah that was one of the things that the stronger kind of creators would uh would tell the audience to pipe down and, and i've mm -hmm. talked about it a lot but yeah chess this kind of weird thing like a game could take 30 40 minutes and every move you can take five to ten seconds it's just you and the board it's not really a whole lot around it's not poker where it's a big delay so yeah. and, and also chat can watch you with a computer so uh mm -hmm. yeah they they'll be like no i mean even now you know, I get like, the, I have the benefit of being a good player, so I can just tell them to like, be quiet or <laughs> e even if they see something, I don't, I'm like, all right, so you play me, you show me, you know, right? you show me you're so good. So I have that benefit. Yeah, dude, it's tough. I know. I know it's really tough. Uh, 
I mean, listen, there's a reason I, I do streaming less and less and less, you know, and I, uh, I don't I mean, play. YouTube is the life, like compared to streaming streamers work so hard. And, you know, there are of course plenty of rewards to be reaped, but when it comes to YouTube, like you do your thing, you mm -hmm. put it out there and then you are done. You sit back, chill yep. and just like watch, watch the views come in, hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's all you got to do. And then it just sits out there and then you get to watch other streamers react to your videos and they do the streaming for you. And it's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, yeah. Like when chess was booming, sometimes they would go on YouTube and they would pull up chess videos and chess drama or whatever. Uh, and they would, yeah. Like sometimes I'd, I'd see around that same time where I was like contacting you, like XQC might be playing to 40, 50,000 people, which is not a number that right now would be low for a video or a stream or something, not a, not a live stream. I still don't get that many concurrent viewers. Yeah, it's crazy. Man. <laughs> uh, but uh, nowhere, nowhere close, by the way. I think the most viewers I ever had in one stream was like 10,000. So I cannot imagine having 70,000 or something. That's pretty good. Most I could say is probably like 1,500. <laughs> and that was like after you rated me. Other oh. than that, it was like, you know, maybe 80 people. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, streaming is, streaming is tough, man. Like it, 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 it really is tough. Uh, and... Yeah, I would see them pull up a chess video and I'd be like, wow, I'm on like this page over here. Or, like like my video's on the screen or or this and that. Or the one time Joe Rogan on his podcast said kind of an aside like about my Indonesia chess drama. Oh, uh, wow, okay. Yeah, but that's he didn't a, name me. Yeah, he kind of like, he kind of was like, oh, you see this like Indonesia chess? And I was like, oh, that's like so cool. But yeah, you know, uh, yeah, it, YouTube is a totally different thing because... If you make content that's kind of just like your your content, you could watch anytime. First thing in the morning, before sleep, at any point during the day, if it pops up, it's like an interesting bit of content. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, this is like a tier list of animals or birds or reptiles. Well, birds are animals, but you you know, th <laughs> things that, and like the editing is good. There's like sound effects from games. Once I started playing a little bit more video games, I realized you actually use like a lot of sound effects from games, especially oh, Overwatch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we played some Overwatch back in the day, right? I think. Oh did yeah, you? yeah, we did a little bit. Have you been playing the new one at all? No, dude, I I quit, and quitting for me was like quitting smoking. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, it was it was very it was good. You play Overwatch still? I, I played a little bit of Overwatch too. Yeah, that's probably been my like take a break from editing game. You know, play a game or two uh, for about a half hour. You like it? It's fine. I think it's it's still a fun game, and I think the way that they've kind of balanced things um changes it in a way that's you know it, it has some advantages and disadvantages but i think in general it's a lot less uh frustrating the 5v5 it's supposed to 6v6 because with the two the old like 6v6 meta it was like there was so many shields mm -hmm. and it was just shoot the shield until the shield goes down and then hope you can score a point or score a, a few good hits uh and then build your ult charge and then hope you win that way Whereas now I think there's a bit more that individual players can have control and more agency over the game. Now, of course, when you take out, you know, half of the defensive capabilities of the team, the support characters are kind of struggling a little bit, but that's okay. Um, oh, it's one tank? They removed one, one tank now, exactly. So uh -huh. now if you play, if you play any support that doesn't have a really good escape ability, if you play Zenyatta or someone or Mercy, they're kind of just getting ragged on the whole time. So everyone's uh, playing all the supports that can teleport or fly or whatever, or jump high, that kind of thing. Were you were you playing Moira when we played? I, I think probably Moira was still like one of the best characters. I mean, especially with her ability to teleport out of mm -hmm. basically anything. Like she's probably the most evasive support character. So um seeing a lot of play right now especially in the lower ranks where people don't really protect their supports right which represent like i'm not saying oh you know these lower ranks like no that's me i'm the lower rank. oh <laughs> so, damn dude so does this mean that my my hamster pick is probably dead <laughs> i don't know it seems like most people play like zarya now for the tank like zarya or uh sigma or what i see a lot wow uh, hamster is I don't know. Like hamster doesn't really protect your team, is the problem. No, that yeah. So it used to be much better when I had like Ryan Hamster because I could just like go in, exactly. just destroy people, and totally. Yeah, I mean now you, you pretty much just have the tanks that stay with the team and sit with the team, so you don't see as much of the hamster or the the ape Winston where they're always getting in, getting out. I mean you still see Diva kind of 
because she's really uh, good at defending her team as well. But these hyper mobile tanks aren't as important as the ones that can defend. Anyway, lots of Overwatch talk, but um, yeah, I I think it's pretty fun. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, damn. No. no, stop. I was not playing for so long. Hey, we could get a few games in, man. Oh, man, I um, yeah, I I, I got tired of uh of just logging in and just getting like just really <laughs> depressed like every mm -hmm. evening because I would just have awful voice comms with yeah. just terrible humans. Uh, sometimes I would have fun. I would like boot up with a friend and um, he would, tr I would let him handle the trash talk because I'd be on my Gotham chess account. Sure. So I can't, I can't misbehave. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You but, say one thing, they'll be all over the internet. Well, they also didn't even believe it was me half the time. They'd be like, are you Gotham Chess? I'd be like, yeah. They'd be like, you don't sound like him. I'd be like, what? Like, what? I, That's I, funny. I, I haven't, I don't use the, the Tirzu name on Blizzard anyway. I do use it for other things. And I've had that happen a few times. Like I have it in Apex Legends where someone would be like, yo, I love your channel. And that's always fun. But I think the good thing about being a lower rank player is that people don't use the voice comms nearly as often. Um, so it's just a little bit less toxic, I think. You, know, you still get people spamming the chat at the end of the game, like, oh, like our DPS sucked or our yeah. support wasn't healing, whatever. But that's a, that's about the end of it. You don't have people raging on the mic the entire match, that kind of thing, which I'm yeah. sure is probably pretty common in like the gold and platinum and above ranks. That's yeah, I got up to mid plat, like 2700. Dang, okay, okay, and, nice. Uh, yeah, my hamster was like 27. My, my hamster was probably diamond level, but the problem is that like your team doesn't play around probably the best player. Like yeah. I was, I was nasty with hamster, but other tanks I was all right. And yeah, dude, it was, oh my god, it was crazy. Your first push, you die like immediately, just racial slurs, homophobic yeah. slurs, oh, like gosh. Oh. oh gosh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. A few times I I reported people and they got banned, and you know I was excited about that, but. Well, it tells you when you, when someone gets banned. I think so. Yeah, it was like reports. thanks for reporting. Like okay. we took action on a. Yeah, same online in chess. If you like report an account and that account gets banned for cheating. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, Didn't know that. Should have reported my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, straight no, up, by the way. He uh, probably did get banned, actually, eventually. That's probably that's the only probably reason. He came clean. He's like, out. yo, if he goes back and looks at those games. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that was a really good engine move right there. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> I know the caps with the 99. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, but I'm telling you, it's actually kind of common. Like, I've even had subscribers reach out, like, yo, man, like, uh, can you take a look at this game? Like, I've been playing chess like six months, and my friend just never played chess. He just beat me 99%. I'm like, uh huh. Yo, his friend's straight up just cheating against. Like, this, this is so wild that people just cheat against their friends. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm super good. So I guess, yeah, it, it's, it happens way more than you would think for some reason. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it makes sense. Like, the, the game of chess is such a... Uh, it, it, it just invites so much pride. You know, people attach, mm -hmm. like, their their value of, like, their intelligence to this game. Like, yep. if you're good at chess, like, people are like, dang, this man is, like, a super ultra genius. Mm -hmm. and so losing a chess can be like oh man he really just like is <laughs> ahead of me and just smarter than me yep. which i'm sure no. isn't really the case it's just practice in chess but you know it's it's like shocking how true this is it's also shocking in adults learning the game especially adults that are successful in mm -hmm. other fields like law anything corporate right they all try to like imprint their own way of playing the game you know like they they're like i'm not gonna take lessons like i'm gonna i'm gonna do it my way like I, I i uh i've known people who like cheat but they'll cheat only like a little bit in the games and then they'll like lose anyway and they'll be like well i'm like learning because i'm using stockfish during my games i'm trying to learn how the engine thinks mm. i'm like no you're not <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> no you're not because you're not gonna know in the next game that same moment you just you're not learning patterns you're just using external assistance but yeah Teaching, really? I think, like, teaching kids is, was tough. That was my career early on. Mm -hmm. Teaching kids is tough. Teaching some stubborn adults is even harder. I imagine, yeah. yeah. You can't deconstruct and basically tell them, like, it's okay, you know, chess is not about intelligence and this and that. Because, yeah, it's true. Um, they very right. much just... I'm sure you get people who, like, you know, they're, they're used to, to, to thinking of themselves as, oh, like, I'm a... I'm playing 5D chess in my workspace and mm -hmm. really just masterminding everything. And then they play actual chess and they're like, oh, wait, <laughs> I'm not that good at predicting other people <laughs> or reading the, into their moves. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's exactly how it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, speaking of uh, past careers, I actually don't, 
I specifically didn't do like a massive deep dive because I, I wanted to hear it from you. Uh, what what is your whole story? How did you become Tier Zoo? And I know that you have a like a degree in something totally unrelated. So what what was the journey? <laughs> what, sure. Did... Yeah, yeah. It's it's like tangentially related. It's not totally wacky. Often, like you know, it's not like that word. in on. economics or something that wouldn't even be connected to it. Define um, tangentially. Uh huh. Okay. Like, so, so like my degree is in in microbiology. Um, okay. I went to yeah, I went to UW Madison for a microbiology degree. They have a great program. Uh, specifically, like bacteriology is their their focus. So I learned about a lot about infectious disease and that kind of thing. And I found that stuff really fascinating. Um, my goal was to become an epidemiologist. I wanted to work for the CDC studying pandemics. Thank God, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord that that didn't happen because holy cow, I would be living in a nightmare, especially these past few years. Wow. I would just be, it just would have been a disaster on everything, all, like all my mental health, everything, because oh the world is crazy with that right now. And I am so glad that it's not my responsibility uh, to try you, to like give my opinion on all this. When did you graduate? 2013. No, I'm sorry. 2017 was when I graduated. I graduated. Oh, we graduated at the same time. Hey, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that was, that was what I wanted to do. Um, my plan was to graduate my undergrad, uh -huh. finish my first degree, work for a year, and then go to grad school. And so I did work for a while. And then I got rejected from grad school. <laughs> oh, wow. Why? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think it's just because I didn't know what I was doing. I, I guess if you talk to grad students, they'll tell you, oh yeah, you actually kind of have to, you can't just apply. You can't just apply to wherever and, oh, and cross your fingers and hope to get in. You kind of have to like do the work and talk to these professors that you're applying to and know them and have, you know, kind of the green light already before you even apply. Mm. So I didn't do that. I was lazy and I just like, oh, you know, I'm pretty good. I. I have a decent resume. I've worked in this in this job for a while and I've got all these other things. So here's my here's my application. Please accept me. I'll be good. And they were like, not gonna happen, Chief. Right. So uh that didn't happen, which is fine. Again, that would that probably one of the best things to ever happen to me was being rejected from grad school. One, because grad students are all miserable. Every grad student I know is miserable, but two, because what I wanted to do with that would have been also very miserable. So um, I'm not salty about it, but it is pretty funny looking back. But so what I ended up doing instead was I just kind of stayed at that job for a while. Uh, I stayed at what I was doing as I was a food scientist, um, for a, a food company, um, a, a snack company that they worked on making beef jerky, like high protein snacks, those kinds of things. Um, I mean, I don't know. I could just say the name. I don't think it matters. I worked for Jack Link's, uh, the, messing with Sasquatch brand. Um, so okay, that doesn't that mean was, anything to me. Wait, is that, uh, me, do I not know my beef, beef jerky brands? I mean, it, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't, but also they're pretty common. Like you'd see them being advertised at like even the Super Bowl, I oh, think. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I've seen them. Oh, I never realized like that was, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, they're pretty common in like convenience stores and that kind of thing. And I think they make good stuff. Um, but yeah, that's what I did for, for a while after I graduated college. And it is tangentially related. I mean, you do need a good um, grasp of basic microbiological uh, concepts in order to understand how the process works because these foods, they are fermented and the fermentation process is done by bacteria. So that's part of the cooking process. Um, and yeah, so that, that's what I did for a while. It was basically just like running experiments and tests on how to improve the products that we were making. And that was cool, you know, it's a job. I didn't love the fact that I had to travel all the time for it. Like I was constantly going back, back and forth between um, their headquarters. There are several different uh, like corporate offices and where I was at individually stationed, which was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, so yeah, it just in general, I thought it was, it was fine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, around the time that I graduated um, college, I also 
started making YouTube videos. I, I happened upon a few YouTube videos that I was watching at my job and I thought, oh, like, I think I could do something kind of similar to this. Who are you watching? Um, I was watching a lot of the like educational stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, and also just some comedy stuff. The, one of the videos that really kind of sparked the inspiration for me was watch, I watched a video by a YouTuber called Casually Explained. And he had a video that was all about evolution, but it was framed in this the same sort of jokey, tearless way. And it wasn't like educational. It was just a comedy skit and it was really funny and I loved it. But I thought, oh, like that's really like you could definitely do that and have it actually be educational. I think that would work really well. And then he his was done using hand drawn animation comic style art and i was like well you could do that but you could also use actual footage and put these sort of video game uh graphics and sprites and vfx over the top of it and, I, and that'd be kind of funny and so i tried that and then immediately not well not quite immediately but very quickly built an audience uh and this was this was after working this was after graduating only well okay like the time between graduating college and being able to quit my job because of how well the channel was doing was very short. It was only about nine months. Mm. And uh, realistically, I probably could have quit even sooner than that. Right. But I was nervous, of course, because I don't know. You, you never know how ephemeral a YouTube career is gonna be. Thankfully, I've made it about half a decade now, but it absolutely could have totally flopped after only a few videos, you never know. Um, so that's I that's I guess like a fairly comprehensive backstory. Yeah. Of, of myself. But uh, did you did you put out a few videos before you decided to quit, or you just sort of you were like? Oh, several. Yeah, I probably like ten, um, because at the time I was making a video every two weeks, and I stayed at my job for, like I had my initial blow up with which with which was with the cat tier list yeah. that you mentioned earlier. Um, that was the first one that really took off. And that was about, that was after about three months of making content. Before that, I had put out, you know, five or six videos that all had a reasonable um, view count, but not enough to live off of, not even close. Um, so I was like excited that th this thing was growing, but I was definitely not like, oh yeah, this could be, this could be the rest of my life, or at least in the short term of a prudent business move to just focus on this. Um, but then the cat tier list blew up and it kind of just stayed up. Things just kept being quite popular. Every new video I put out would get onto like r slash videos on Reddit and, um, yeah, would just get a lot of traction. And I was like, oh, like, I guess I do have a fairly consistent, sustainable audience. Um, and I was able to kind of show that to sponsors and an agency. And at that point, they when they signed me, I was guaranteed uh, for the rest of the year, like a, a sponsor fee on all of my videos for the rest of that year, which would which that sponsorship rate like blew my yearly salary out the water wow. at, at this place. So uh, I was like, well, I, it would be foolish not to focus everything on this then. Wow. What so was I did. The, and can, it, yeah. can, can you share what the sponsor was? Uh, well, I signed with an agency called, at the, at the time it was called Standard, and now it's called Nebula. Um, but yeah, they, they, they hooked me up with sponsors like Skillshare and Brilliant, uh, who were able to sign with me for the rest of the year. And at that point, it was great. You know, I had security, at least for that year, uh, and guaranteed income, and it was great. Wow. Oh, so, and you've been with them ever since? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's a... Uh... That's amazing. Cause that, that's a lot like in the creator space, what it what is it like five, you said six years, right? I mean, that's like a lot of things change and a lot of, but they, to be happy for six years, it's really good. I feel like in the yeah. creator space. Yeah. They never let me down. You know, I've always been able to get a sponsor for my video and they've been good at, at keeping the rates uh, consistent with the growth of my channel. So yeah, no complaints. What exactly is the difference between having what you have and just having basically like one of the large talent agencies as being your agents? Actually, I'm also kind of trying to learn. Uh, this mm. is probably useful for the audience, but just so people understand, like creators generally don't 
need to go out and solicit sponsors. And we also tend to not respond to individual emails, right? Like if an email comes to us from 90% exactly. of the time it's spam and 10% of the time it's actual opportunity, but we need that barrier. Like we need to put the agents on them. So if the agents re request the price, that's ridiculous. It's the agents requesting it. It's not us, you know? So it's like one of yeah. these uh, tricky things. So yeah, uh, there's a ton of advantages, of course. I mean, not only do you have just having someone else kind of work on the whole yeah. deal making side of it, who's has experience with that, because if you're not, you know, I'm not a business major. I don't really know all that sphere and I've gotten more familiar with it as time has gone on, of course, but it's still good to have other eyes on it um, to know you're not being, getting screwed. But also it's like, okay, if, if someone, if a sponsor tries to like back out of their offer or like totally screw you over, it's, it's much harder for them to screw over an agency who reps, you know, dozens or hundreds of creators than it is for them to just be like, okay, uh, we're not going to pay you. And if you want us to pay us, or if you want us to pay you, you're going to have to sue us or whatever. Like it's very difficult. If, if a sponsor did that to me, I'd be like, okay, like, I guess I'm out whatever the money was, but if they do that to my agency, it's like, good luck. Like they're going to sue you, of course. And because you can't do this to um, several dozen creators. So the, it is definitely a good buffer to have. But um, so your question was, um, yeah, like the difference, the difference between, between yeah, yeah the, the general, well, I guess like the really broad talent agencies that rep like celebrities and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not, I'm not terribly familiar with that kind of uh, side of things, but I think it, they focus a lot more on getting you in-person events and getting you um, like, I don't know, like brand deals where, you know, you're on, you know, if you're a sports star, you yeah. get to be on the cereal box or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, so it's just, they're just so much more general uh, that having this very niche targeted uh, agency, I think is more helpful uh, where they're able to, to really get you into specific creator focused events that are really within your bubble of, uh, of networking um, and also just deals that better tie into your brand, that kind of thing. Like I've worked with Curiosity Stream for the past uh, few years and they're really good. Uh, they're a really good link to my brand, of course, because they make educational nature content a lot of the times. Uh, so it fits right in. Whereas I think if I was, you know, if I was working with a really traditional uh, media thing, they would probably just have me sell Coca-Cola or like Pepsi or whatever, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't know. I can't really speak too much on that because I, I, I'm not really in that sphere. I don't know much about mainstream celebrities. Uh, but I guess there, there is also a kind of another uh, sphere of agencies called MCNs, multi-channel yeah. networks. So those are the things on YouTube. And what they do is they, they take a cut of your ad revenue on YouTube. The, the Google ads that play on your videos, they will take a cut of that. In ex but in exchange, they will get specific people to advertise through them. I think it's, it's, it's a little different because like what my agency does is they'll hook me up with a brand deal and then I make the advertisement myself and I put it at the end of my videos. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think some of these other MCNs, instead of doing that, although they will sometimes do that as well, um, but their main focus is kind of um, optimizing the AdSense experience uh, and yeah. finding targeted advertisement that way. Yeah, I know uh, a bit more about MCNs. Uh, it's, it's actually kind of fascinating. It sort of unlocks like a weird area of YouTube you don't have as an individual yeah. creator. Right. Uh, I had to get an MCN involved when I had, when I was basically attacked oh. during the drama. Okay. And yeah. I, I had to geo block content. Yeah. Which is, that makes sense. Which is a crazy thing to do, but you have to block your, con your content from accessing, being accessed in a certain place in the world uh, during the whole uh, Indonesia thing, which I've talked about at length many, many times. But for some people, it's still news whenever they hear it. They're like, what are you talking about, Indonesia? Uh, and um, yeah, I had to like hook them on, and then all your ad revenue goes through them. They pay you out. Uh, but when you disconnect that, it's a messy process. Like a lot of things YouTube are kind of like messy. Like I was demonetized for a week. I had to reapply for monetization. And YouTube is crazy like that because there's like no one you can reach out to to just snap your fingers and get back in. You got to go through the whole, I don't even know if it's called bureaucracy. That's usually paperwork. I don't know. I don't know what the what, digital bureaucracy. 
Yeah, you gotta sure. Them. Yeah, everything I've heard about MCNs is that they're a nightmare to work with and oftentimes very scummy and don't really do what they say they're going to do. It just kind of, they'll just kind of take your ad revenue and give you a cut of it, but it's like, they're not really doing anything to be worth that cut. Whereas working with an agency, it's like they'll, they bring me the deals and they take a cut of just those deals, but they don't mess with anything else. Like everything else is still mine. They don't have any ownership of me. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It To me, it seems kind of silly to work with them, but I guess they are very plugged into the YouTube, like the, the back end mechanics. Yeah. So if you need to geo block something, that's definitely <laughs> something that I guess they could help you with. Yeah. Yeah. I've never wanted to do that, but yeah. I can imagine if me you're neither, getting, except for a month in my life. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're getting targeted harassment from a specific uh, point on the globe, yeah, okay, sure. Right, and also I feel like, um, well, I met. I think I met some of the people when you came to visit New York, right? I, yeah. You, you kind of have like a. It's not really an agency. I mean, you have you have like friends. I mean, there's just at the end of the, like yeah. you friends first, yeah. you have like a collective. You also like, if you ever need anything technical or research, whatever for your videos, it's uh, yeah, it's nice. I mean, you, you, you have a, you have a really amazing setup. It, the, one of the biggest things that is still a total mystery to me is the learning curve of the whole social world of YouTube creators. Hmm. Like, okay. Because for the last two years, literally basically every day i make a chess video and sometimes i make two and i enjoy it like i would never walk away from it there's tons of chess content constantly um and i i don't think it's like very common to upload a video every single day for two years i feel like that's kind of it's kind of nutty um but what i've sacrificed in that is i've just i haven't socialize or networked anywhere near as much as I should. And every time I try, I just, I get really exhausted because I feel like mm. everyone's already kind of in their groups. So like breaking in is tough and um, staying consistent with it is tough too, because if you just di dip your toes when you need something or just like to network and then you never, like that's also shitty and I'm not that kind of person. So I, I'm like learning to, to kind of, you know, get a, get involved a, a little bit more, communicate a little bit more. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy. I mean, I, I, I love that setup, uh, that you have. And I, and I, I think the, some of the other people I met that day, um, when we played some poker in, in New York have, mm -hmm. it's tough though. Yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a tough world. And sometimes you feel on your own, like one day you get an email and they're like, your AdSense account is deleted, but then you find out right. that everybody got that email. So, yeah, I mean, I, one very early on in my YouTube career, uh, one of my friends told me um, that the first rule of success is showing up. And I kind of just took that and was like, oh, that's going to be my thing for, for as long as I can do that. So I, at this point, I think it's kind of a meme how often I show up in just random places on the internet, like weird corners of that people wouldn't expect, like, I don't know, random Pokemon videos or Yu-Gi-Oh videos or chess videos or uh, food science videos or whatever. Like, I don't know. I, I, I really like collaborating and putting myself out there, but it is exhausting for sure. Like I definitely empathize with people who are like, it's not, not for me, um, that kind of thing. A lot of it I think is online, like just being active in various community chat rooms, discord servers, forums, that kind of thing. Uh, that's a good way to meet people. And I think that really kind of came to a head in 2020 when there was the big Among Us craze. Yeah. And every creator just wanted to rope as many other creators in to get a good creative or a creator Among Us stream, that kind of thing. And that was a good time for me to just like kind of get in there and be like, yeah, I'll play Among Us. Like I, I know how to play those. I've played like Secret Hitler and, and uh, Mafia and those sorts of party games. So I kind of know the basics. I can... I can get in that. Um, and yeah, I met so many, so many people doing that. And that was great. And just keeping up with them and, and staying friends and offering to be in cameos or whatever. That's, I think that's all you really got to do. Just be in the Discord servers and, and say hi to people and be friends. And I don't know. To me, it, it never seemed too, too tough just to be nice to people and you know, of course, when there's drama, there's drama, and that's annoying. But yeah, once your big luckily, drama coming, you could. Yeah, hopefully never. Right. Um, luckily, the educational side of YouTube is not terribly dramatic. Uh, I think it'd be kind of difficult to to be dramatic because I don't think anyone really cares 
about us as people. Like it, it just a blessing and a curse, of course. You know, if if someone were to just body snatch me and replace me and be like, hey, I'm Tearsu now and I have a slightly different voice, um, but that's it, and we're still gonna make the same content. I think people would would generally be okay with that. I don't think anyone would really be like, oh no, get Patrick back. He's that's what that's what we're here for. No, people aren't here for that. Um, you don't think so? You don't think your voice is like iconic? I think for probably a very small percentage of my audience, mm -hmm. they would care for sure. But I've seen I've seen this happen where where channels will literally just swap out their host when the the old host is like, I'm kind of tired of doing this. Wow. Uh, I'm gonna hire someone else. I'm gonna sell off the brand, and people aren't really gonna complain much at all. Uh, Have you gotten an so offer to buy your channel? No, no. I mean, oh, not seriously. Oh. Like I've got some random people sliding in my email saying, "Hey, can I offer you?" You know, it's got to be millions, right? Chunk. No, that's the funny thing is, it's not. It's like oh. it's like nothing. They'll be like, "Hey, I will offer you, you know, five thousand dollars for your channel." Like, yeah, let me sign away my oh. whole life's work for five grand. Sure, you got it. Um, but I do know, I, I know at least one other channel that has sold their entire brand for at least a million um, and switched hosts and they did fine. Wow. So it can happen. And, but yeah, the, the point being um, the drama just isn't interesting enough for people. Yeah, <laughs> Unless yeah, yeah. like someone does something just heinously evil, which doesn't happen very often. No one really cares. You know, if, if someone, I don't know what, what's something people normally have drama about. I don't know, like breakups or like relationship stuff. Like no one yeah. cares about um, who, who a you or an educational YouTuber is like married to or dating or whatever. It just doesn't matter because they don't show up in your channel. Yeah. They're, it's usually just very business, very straightforward. Um, so there's not a ton <laughs> to go off of there. So I think it's good. I, I, of course, there are, of course, advantages to having a very personal connection with your audience where you have, you know, the parasocial thing where people are really hyper invested in being or in feeling like they're your friend. And then if you do something wrong, then they feel like you personally hurt their, uh, you know, you damaged your, your reputation in front of them. Or, and now they feel or betrayed. they'll defend you to the death. Like or that, yeah, yeah, which can yeah. be equally as toxic. You know, if you do something wrong and then everyone's like, well, I like him, so I'm going to defend you to the death. That's also really not good. Yep. So, yeah, I, I'm glad to avoid that. I haven't really ever had anything too dramatic happen in in uh, the YouTube sphere that I'm in. I, I think the most yeah. dramatic thing was that I've seen was when this other YouTuber made this hit piece on another youtuber friend of mine it was uh a youtuber who at the time had a had a channel called coffee break um and he did a, did this video about a channel called kurzkasaw and it was that was like kind of the talk of the youtube sphere for maybe a day and then after that no one really cared and it was like kind of nothing it was it was mostly just like oh this person said they were going to collaborate with me and then they didn't and they, <laughs> that made me feel upset and it's like that was it okay cool whatever <laughs> wow wow that's uh yeah that's real bad and uh yeah no no real doozy oh i see i see i see i see yeah and then both creators have of course gone on to be totally successful in their own right and no one cares about any of that anymore which is for the best of course i think coffee break now does this other channel called coffee zilla or i don't know if it's even the same channel maybe he just renamed it and now he does these really interesting deep dives on all these sorts of weird cryptocurrency schemes and communities and that kind of thing. And Quartz Cassad still does their usual educational stuff. Oh and my that's God. all good and no one I cares. Thought, I thought he looked familiar. Oh, that's the same dude. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, wow. and, that, and that's, I think they're both doing great. I don't think anyone cares about that drama and I don't think anyone really should have cared in the first place. And that's about all <laughs> that's like really the height of, of YouTube drama that I've seen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I've watched uh, some of these videos too. Um, how do you say that word? Kurt? I think it's said Kurzgesagt, but there's a few other letters in there that I'm like, I just assume they're silent, but I don't really know. Kurz, Kurz, yes, Kurzgesagt. Is it a German word? <laughs> it's yeah. I think it's German. I think it's yeah. German for in a nutshell, um, or like said shortly or something like that, but uh -huh. whatever. Anyways. Yeah, the, at, the only thing that was like really funny at the time was that Kurtz Kassar at the time was also working with the same agency that I was working with, 
And when Coffee Break did the hit piece on them, they kind of also said that, oh, this agency is like the mafia. They're the smart YouTuber mafia. And we took that and ran with it because we thought it was really funny. Um, so yeah, if you want to call us the smart YouTuber mafia, go ahead. I think it's pretty cute, pretty funny, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. We're not, we're not breaking down people's doors, racketeering or anything. Ah, uh, yeah. You guys are like the, 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 what the, the nerd mafia of YouTube or something. Yeah. 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 I don't think we're going to make anyone sleep with the fishes, but you know, we might, we might make a really smart video and. That's fu that's funny. Oh yeah, get views on it. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, because you guys do a lot of educational stuff. Yeah, dude, I, right. man, that's crazy. You have seventy eight videos posted. That's it. Oh my god, and you've been doing this for six years. See, you say that, but to me, that's like, oh man, has it really? Have I really made that many? I'm still making these videos. Bro, I have I love, a thousand videos in two it. years, I dude. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, for, in two for years, years <laughs> you make the video every day or multiple times a day. It's like I don't know how you do it. And yeah, it's, I, I mean, like the biggest chess channels right now, right? Like you have Hikaru, but Hikaru doesn't record for YouTube. He has a whole team. Like yeah. he does cool shit on stream. They cut it up. They mm -hmm. post to YouTube. Their, their goal is not, you know, like banger pieces once every two months. It's just, it's just kind of a pipeline and that's totally fine. And then like, you look at like, I got Mata, for example, who has like 3000 videos. Cause back in the day, this dude would post like five videos in one day. Sometimes, you know, it's just yeah. on whatever historical games. Yeah, dude. I mean, sometimes I get tired, but um like my whole thing is if i'm tired i got nothing to do like mm -hmm. i can only do one thing today and everything else i'm gonna nap and just be tired i have to make a youtube video like no yeah. matter what and slowly i'm gonna have to pull that plug because i'm gonna go nuts but i got 20 video ideas on my sticky notes right here on my channel uh, i mean on my desktop <laughs> and uh i make yeah. the thumbnails first and then you know i uh but that's yeah. wild I mean, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to each strategy. Like I, I very much like being able to sit back and work my hardest on one video for a long time and have it be exactly the thing that I want to put out. Um, and then, you know, have it be there, but there is a lot of disadvantages to that too. Whereas, okay, if something goes wrong with that, that's like two or three months of work that had a problem. And now it, maybe it's forever ruined, you know, for, for example, if something gets age restricted or demonetized on YouTube, or if there was a mistake that you just didn't catch, um, that can really be a huge blow <laughs> to, to your like confidence and, uh, you know, feeling of security on YouTube. Uh, yeah. if something goes wrong with this huge tent pole moment in your career, or at least what you hoped was going to be that, uh, like for me, I don't know, like I'm working on what is right now, my biggest video that I've ever made, like it's almost half an hour long. Um, and it's wow. about my favorite animals, which are insects, small little creatures, and I love them. But uh, I I see all these things on on Twitter about how oh age restrictions on YouTube and community guideline strikes are going up. You never really know what's going to happen. Sometimes people just get their stuff taken down and don't don't know why. And I'm worried because I'm like, okay, I mean, there's sort of, I mean, it's insects, but there's kind of animal violence in there. Maybe that is going to be enough to trigger their flagging system and their sensors and algorithm and that kind of thing. Is this going to be a huge waste? I don't know. Um, can you so, re-upload? Like if something goes I mean, wrong? You, you can, you can re-upload, but it doesn't, it, it's never going to have the same fuel under it. That's going to rocket it to millions and millions of views. If you re-upload something that people have already seen, because most people would be like, Oh, I saw this already. I don't have to watch this. And so they'll skip it. And then, the click through rate on your video goes through the floor, of course. So, you know, that's really disheartening. Whereas, you know, if you upload videos every single day, if one of them has a problem, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's not the biggest yeah. disaster in the world. You're not like, you didn't, you weren't betting the farm on that. You know, you didn't invest every, all your resources for several months into making this work. I, I've only ever taken down, I think like one video. Uh, and, uh, it was, I was very early on YouTube and mm -hmm. I was just playing some speed games on chess.com and some grandmaster like trash talked me during the games, <laughs> like just blitz games out here. And he uh -huh. was spitting on me. He was writing two, like two, you know, like, 
And I beat him like three nothing. I just crushed him like nothing. Oh, okay, okay. I thought and you were gonna say that he like demolished you, and you were like, "Oh, this is too." No, I, I look like a clown. Okay. No, no, no. So like, I beat him, and then I made like this, you know, goofy thumbnail because I had I don't know ten thousand subscribers, something really small. Mm -hmm. Um, and small compared to now. Listen, if you're out there grinding, don't don't think 10k is small. But you know, just compare now. You know, my my guest here right now got 3.3 million. So to him, 10k is nothing. But no, uh, no, it's not. I mean, I would I would honestly say that if you get to a thousand subscribers on YouTube, you are closer to a million than you are to zero. Is how I would view it because like mm. it is very very hard to get over that initial hump of having no viewers. Mm. But once you get a few, it's not hard to get to get that to grow. Yep, yep. It's a uh... It's it's also like kind of interesting. People might overcomplicate the process of getting views. Like, um, there's a small channel on YouTube that like randomly pops up on my recommended. It's this guy. I think his name is Epic Chess, and he has a video that popped up yesterday. It has like almost a million views. It's just explained. It's just explained the biggest chess cheating scandal in history. It's just a voiceover of everything that happens between Magnus and Hans, but it's got a million views. Like, you mm -hmm. you put in some work into editing. And just some good voiceover, some like, de like I said, to have decent editing, couple hours, like tops, and you really can make a good product. And if you put the title well, you know, um, it's like to, honestly, it's not, it's not, ex it's not extremely challenging. A lot of people fail because the editing is not good, the titles are not good. You're not, you're not thinking about the way the viewer wants to be entertained and the, you know, the way the way they they want to approach the content. Um, so yeah, yeah, I agree. I think really the only thing. The only real hurdle you need to overcome initially is making sure you have a kind of a good cadence to your speech when you're doing a voiceover, if that's what you're doing, if you're doing yeah. a voiceover for a video. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not having any long, awkward yeah. pauses, that kind of thing. You know, like when there's the, just that little bit where people are like, mm, I don't like, I think I'm going to go watch something else that doesn't make me feel like I'm watching an awkward speech yeah. of someone who was underprepared for their little thing, um, that kind of thing. I think that's all you really need to do. I think um, I think nowadays most of us are getting some sort of Instagram reels or TikToks of you know real estate or business development or something. Most of us, and it's always mm -hmm. like really well edited, quick, flashy. Sometimes like so well edited that they talk over themselves by like half a second. Yeah, you know? that's that's the J cut. That's that's, yeah, that's like, the standard now. It's like da -da 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 -da. like they just keep like, and I'm like, man, like. Kind of wish I would do that just for some. I'm trying to get good at something besides chess to test if I will be able to build a brand outside of chess. Um, so if I get good at like renovating houses or something, I'm gonna start like seeing if I can build that up with like yeah. the editing and brand building skills that I've built. But I don't know. It's so tough and it's so. It's uh, yeah, it's a bit overwhelming. But that, that goes back to like I took down that video. I I posted this video. <laughs> and you know I like hit his name, but what I didn't realize was people would go just they would put in the moves and like put my profile and on chess.com if you have the moves of a game in the profile you can you know you can find the opponent oh yeah so they found his account like hundreds of people like went and harassed the guy and then the guy dm me like what the hell man what is this and uh i was like ah it's like stuff like that so i decided to take it down but uh yeah i mean the equivalent would be terrible if that was my one video in two months that sucks yeah, absolutely really yeah, anything that involves another creator is just a, a bit riskier than anything else. Even if it's a collab, like you never know if this person is about to just have their whole career taken from them from with a big scandal mm -hmm. or something. So that is definitely, or you know, in reverse, where it's like you are the scandal that's putting people, giving them negative attention, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that can definitely be. So it, yeah, as someone who works mostly by myself, uh, I think I'm at least a little insulated from that kind of thing. But, you yeah. you edit your own videos? Uh, the one I'm working on right now, I'm editing myself. Yeah, uh, some of the most recent videos on my channel, um, I've so written and scripted and recorded, of course, but they're edited by uh, another person. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to expand a little bit so that I can make more videos. But at, at the same time, this one being my, you know, I kind of want it to be the whole the magnum opus, the greatest video I ever make. So I'm just like, this one's all me. I'm gonna take care of this one. Maybe I'll have you pitch in for a few motion graphics or something, but the, this one I need total, total, absolute control over. So I know it's all, all good. Is there, can you, can you tell the subject or you can't tell the subject? Oh, I mentioned it's about, it's the insect tier list. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yes, you did. Sorry. Yeah, you absolutely did. Uh, for, 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 but like I rebuilt up this image that it was going to be like super mysterious. And then I just disconnected yeah. the fact that you said insects. 
Um, well, the tier lists are are always my channel's biggest um, hits. So, and with insects being my favorite, and also one of the most diverse, uh, you know, groups of creatures on the planet, there's just so much to talk about. So. Are mosquitoes on it? Yeah. Do you know the other day in the middle of a recap, I was like, are mosquitoes insects? Dude, I got roasted so hard because I <laughs> yeah, just say yeah, yeah. shit and then people are just like, you know, I'm like, are mosquitoes even classified as insects? Mm. They are. They're flies. So, uh, yeah, they're. I don't specifically call out mosquitoes, but they're part of the fly category. Um, that's, that's one of the things that I found really frustrating about making this video is that uh, I would love to do this deep dive into each individual category, you know, like there's thousands and thousands of different species of beetle. There's thousands yeah. of different species of fly, thousands of different species of grasshopper and that kind of thing. But in order to make a video where I explain all of those things, I would have to find footage of all those individual things. And so much of like stock footage is really just poorly indexed on things like on five Getty images, all these like stock footage websites. You can't really find individual species. Like the best you can hope for is to search by like these broad categories, like fly or butterfly or beetle or that kind of thing. But if you try to search like hyper specific species, it's not going to be there. And if they do happen to have something that's that species, it's not going to be labeled like that. It's just going to be labeled beetle on the flower. And that's okay, cool. Yeah. And now I have to look through every beetle clip on the entire internet to find the one that is the actual species that I want to do a video about. So, yeah, I, would I was going to ask it. you if you can walk me through the process of when you conceptualize an idea to conclusion. So how does that work? How many hours of research do you have to do? Like, how do you write the script? At what point do you write the script? How much editing do you do like of the script of the material inside and how many just, yeah, step by step, you know, um, from yeah. conceptualization of the idea. Like, do you have a bunch of ideas already right now? Um, I definitely have a few that I would like to do, but the, the main thing is that it is, it's all about the footage. It's all about what I can find and what I have access to. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, for example, if just a random animal that I haven't done a video about, for example, giraffes, giraffes are a really cool creature, very charismatic, very interesting, lots of really wacky, you know, things I could call abilities or perks or special things about them, but to find a video there's, there's not a, enough footage of giraffes doing interesting things that I think I can make a video about. Like they, you know, my videos are very focused on the inter or intra, you know, interspecies reactions or interactions between other, other species. So I talk about, you know, various matchups and how one creature fares in combat against creatures that have various other abilities. And so what I want, what I really look for um, are, creatures or topics where there is a broad selection of clips that illustrate a lot of different um, matchups and different points and abilities and how well the creature fares in a wide variety of interactions. And in a lot of cases, that's just not there. It's just not going to happen. There's not, there's not a video of giraffes uh, interacting with a bunch of different species. It's mostly just giraffes kind of you know, if you go on YouTube and search that kind of thing, you'll see them kind of headbutting each other maybe. And maybe there's one or two videos of lions kind of messing with them. But since they're so big, most things don't mess with them at all. And so it's just kind of, I could either have a video that's comprised mostly of giraffes standing there, maybe eating some leaves out of a tree. And then with me doing the voiceover, or I could make something about something else because otherwise it's not going to happen. So if long story short if if there's not footage of their of them doing something interesting that i can personally get access to it's just i can't make the video and so with especially a lot of these niche creatures um it's really tough to find footage that i can source that i can pay for and buy and have the rights to um and actually get to make a video about it so i mean that's why a lot of the most popular videos i've done are just about things that have a ton of video or that that people film all the time. For example, cat the cat tier list. Like right. there, there are hundreds and hundreds of videos of lions attacking things, of tigers attacking things, um, and fighting amongst themselves, and this and that. 
Uh, because people, you know, if you if you go on a safari in Africa and you see a lion, you're going to have your camera on it the whole time. And whenever it does anything, that's great. And they do interesting stuff all the time. Yeah. But, you know, getting a getting that for various beetle species or or for any species that just isn't that active, like a giraffe, that kind of thing. Um, it's it's a way harder. And unless I'm going to go there myself and follow these creatures for, you know, weeks at a time, hoping they'll do something cool. <laughs> I can't I can't make the video. So do you have you ever had to pay some absurd fees for footage? I, I mean, I wouldn't call any of it like too absurd. Okay. But yeah, I, I definitely pay for a lot of stock footage because these wildlife photographers that do actually do that, where they will go and follow a creature for an extended period of time just to get the right shot, you know, they're very protective of, of this footage and they want to be paid for it and want it to be used in a way that they find appropriate. And rightfully so. Like, of course, it's hard work. Um, but a lot of times there's not that much of it and, you know, it, it's it's a lot of work. So yeah, they'll, they'll charge a lot for it or, or maybe they'll just say, no, you can't use this. And that's fair enough. Wow. And if you, if you just did it anyway, obviously you don't want to do that. I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying it, but like, if you, you know, if somebody's like a super asshole and you're like, wow, fuck that guy, I'm going to take his five second footage of this draft. Like what can, what can they do? You know, I have had one person actually back when I was a, a lot more, uh, you know, play fast and loose on YouTube and I would just kind of rip whatever I wanted from YouTube and re-upload it. Uh, in the context of my own videos. I did have one guy who I just took, it was a random little video of his cat kind of running back and forth with, with some squirrels. And I was using that to show um, that sort of interaction, that dynamic. And he found it and it was like, hey, that's my footage. You didn't ask. Uh, I'm going to give you a copyright strike. And that, that's fair enough. You know, I, I earned it. I didn't have permission to use his stuff and he decided he didn't want that. So he gave me a copyright strike and then I contacted him. I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. Like you're right. You have every right to be upset. This footage ended up in my video and it wasn't, it, I didn't have the right to do that. So I will pay you if you will, uh, if you will grant me a retroactive license to use your footage, I will give you, I'll, I'll pay you a premium for it. Um, and if you, if you retract the strike and he did, and that was, that was all well and good. And it, you know, cost me several hundred dollars to get that footage, but that or having a copyright strike definitely not to, I'll take right. it. what if he said uh, like ten thousand dollars yeah well that would have been a tough call i don't think okay. I, I don't think i would have done that because especially copyright strikes on youtube they do go away after three months if you take their copyright crash course or whatever oh. uh, if you copyright strike it will like the black mark against you goes away and that's important because if you get three of them you're your whole channel is wiped from YouTube forever and you can't even make another one. So you don't want to get three. And so I, I definitely can't just be like, Oh, you know, I'll just ask for forgiveness, not permission and just take whatever I want every time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they have a restrict me, so be it. I'll just, you know, fix it later. No, if I get three within three months, my career is over. But you know, if, <laughs> if I make a mistake and someone tries to like literally ask me for an arm and a leg, I'll be like, okay, I guess I'll just, you know, stop uploading for three months and private all of my videos and make sure that no one else can strike me for that period of time. And I'll just, and I'll lose that video forever, but I'm not going to pay 10 grand <laughs> to, yeah. to be ransomed out of my own channel. But yeah, yeah. stranger things have happened. Of course, I've, I've seen other YouTube drama of people using, you know, other people's content and getting sued over it and having fees that could potentially go much, much higher than $10,000. Like hundred million. I don't know about hundred mil, but like, a, you know, a million a, is not a current about... event, current events joke for chess. Oh right. yeah. Sure. 400 right. million. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard about this. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. Because it's a, it's, it's a very demanding thing. I mean, your videos, uh, and then, I mean, all the editing, all the research and, Okay, I see. So you're for you, it's basically a matter of like if the footage is not there, you can't make the video, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's there's so many species that my audience is always asking me for, and I'm like, man, I really wish I could make that video, and maybe someday I'll just have the resources to just pay someone or maybe go out myself, yeah, and find that footage myself. But for now, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, so pay, pay a staff member, go to some safari, you know, mm -hmm. take some, yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah. yeah, my my biggest kind of uh, barrier to creating, I, I don't have one because it's chess, but 
it would be the target audience. So there's levels of chess and I don't hit kind of the end tail of it consistently enough for them to kind of take an interest. So a lot mm -hmm. of people go to other people for like instructional chess content. And for me, it's like, if I'm going to make a video and it's not going to do well, I need to make another video over the top of that one. Because if I put out a few videos in a row that just underperform, because they're not interesting, like they're not funny, they're not, they're just purely instructional. You lose your day-to-day -day revenue by like 30, 40% ultimately, because it mm -hmm. just adds up. Like it just, you know, it doesn't push out the rest of your videos either. Your 48 hour or one week goes down or something like that. So yeah. Yeah, I've got some videos I want to make, and I think people would, in the long run, they would definitely watch it. But in the short run, it's, a, I have no guarantee they would watch in the long run. And in the short run, it's like, it's going to well, suck. I, I wonder if, if you've ever thought about, like, do you, do you ever worry that your videos kind of compete with each other? Like to the point where, you know, if you put too many videos out in a short time, instead of watching, instead of having to decide, am I going to watch Gotham Chess today? It's which video am I going to watch? Because I only have time for one, that kind of thing. And it's like, do you think maybe that drives down the overall views uh, of your channel or just on the individual videos? I'm not sure. I don't... Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've thought about it. I generally try to space it out by like eight to 10 hours. So mm -hmm. I, I never, I never upload, you know, twice in like a four hour span. Cause then, then yeah, they cannibalize each other, even in the algorithm, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think certain topics are, are going to be good no matter what, like certain people, Magnus, Hikaru, Hans, at this mm -hmm. point, Hans, uh, it's always going to do well, but yeah, some things just don't do well. Like I put out a video today on chess puzzles, like really fascinating, impossible chess puzzles. And it's like performing horribly, but my logic is, well, I've seen, you know, I, I try to research content all the time. Like other channels over six months will get four or 500,000 views because it's mm -hmm. like, you know. It's like one of these things that constantly gets recommended and people are sort of fascinated by it, you know? Um, I and agree. And I think it's really important to have, I mean, I, I love content that is kind of timeless. They call it evergreen content on YouTube where, you know, you could feasibly watch it two years from now and it's still just as relevant. Um, I think that's pretty cool. And especially with YouTube now, it seems like even looking at the first few hours for performance, you really can't tell how well the video is going to do in the long run. I've had videos that are, I mean, you know that on the YouTube dashboard, you have the little ranking where it's like, this one is a three out of 10, or this one's a 10 out of 10, this one sucks. Or you get a one out of 10, you're like, yes, I nailed it. This one is really popping off. But you know, two days in, sometimes those rankings wildly, wildly shift. I've had videos where it starts off as a one out of 10 and I'm celebrating. And then it suddenly it just really flatlines and no one's watching it now and suddenly not getting the views and it drops and suddenly it's, oh, now this one's a five out of 10. Oh, now it's an eight out of 10. Now it's a nine out of 10. Wow. This is actually one of the worst performing videos I've made in, in a few years. Whereas sometimes I've had the opposite where it starts off doing really crappy and I'm like, oh, I really messed this one up and it slowly climbs and I'm like, oh, okay. Now it's getting there. And those videos end up way, way outperforming anything else I've done in the long run. So it's really hard to tell short term how, how a video is going to do. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Actually, like I just for, I was going to pull up some metrics just mm -hmm. to kind of discuss. And like, I just pulled up my YouTube dashboard and the first comment that I see was like on a video that I made a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And the comment is your videos do nothing but cause people to lose more. You talk too much <laughs> and you just maximize the time for YouTube money. Uh. <laughs> and it's like, a video, you know, it's like how to learn and study chess openings. It's like, yeah, you know, just super like no clickbait, nothing, just absolutely um so I, I i yeah i always enjoy things like that and uh that's like a video that just recommended to someone and they clicked it and they really hated it uh right. it, it's it's very it's very tough to to see sometimes i like to go in videos and see how they've performed over like an 11 month span and it's just fascinating because you know some videos are just dead or like consistent and then it's like yep. um yeah and uh I don't know. Do you, you don't change titles though, do you? You don't like go back and try to change a title to give a video boost, or do you do that? I've, uh, I've, I've done, done it a few times. I've done it more so with the thumbnail. I found that changing the thumbnail mm. has really has, in some cases, more than doubled, sometimes even tripled the amount of views on a video. I'll change the thumbnail, and you can see on the chart immediate spike, and it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of for for the longest time I had this very. Um, distinct thumbnail style where it was just like silhouettes white on black um meant to be just very high contrast kind of eye-catching thing um but i think 
I realized eventually that this wasn't a very good representation of what the video was about. Mm. And so people would click on it and not knowing what it was about. And then they'd see, oh, this is this really weird high concept thing where he's talking about animals, but he's framing it through the lens of all these, this and that video game jargon. And, you know, it's kind of hard to know what you're getting into when you click on that video. Uh, and so what I did was I just kind of switched it up and changed it so that now my thumbnails are these uh, true to life actual images uh, with the video game UI and VFX uh, overlaid on top to make it look like a, you know, kind of a fighting game or whatever. And that is actually a pretty decent approximation of what the video is going to be like, you know? And so people see that and they're like, oh yeah, sure. This looks interesting. It looks like kind of a little animal fight with memes. I'm all about that. And they click it and that's exactly what it is. And so people stick around more. And when I, once I started doing that and realizing that like the views, the views really skyrocketed on my channel and they've stayed up. So when did you realize that? I realized that I think in, I don't know, late 2020, early 2021. Um, and yeah, I had several of my videos that I really wanted to do well. For example, like the, the snake tier list, the lizard tier list, like these were big effort videos for me that initially had only like, I mean, I don't want to say only because like a million views is a lot, but like they would, they would kind of plateau at about a million where it was like, it was mostly just my audience who would already, was already used to the thumbnail style, already used to what I was about watching them. And then I changed it, changed the thumbnail. And suddenly now they're at, you know, five, six million, which is more than my subscriber count. So it's like, okay, clearly there's a lot of new people watching these and who are interested in my content. And that's really encouraging to see and to see that there is a bigger audience out there that wasn't seeing my content before. Maybe I was just leaving a ton on the table with this bad strategy that I had before with these thumbnails. So I'm always a big proponent of, hey, you can switch it up. Yeah. Uh, nothing, nothing about it really gives it, like, it's not like it resets any sort of algorithm thing where the, where the algorithm was like, oh, I see he changed the thumbnail, let's try it again. But it really just, it, all it has to do is if more people are clicking on it, it is going to, you know, in increase how many people are shown the, the or given impressions of that thumbnail. So always try with old videos. If you think you're, you've left some views on the table, give it a few changes. So yeah. You can figure anything out. I, <laughs> that's interesting. I, I'm, I'm just scrolling through your channel, like just to, to, to see, like, for instance, yeah. your video, are bats overpowered? Like, why didn't you shorten op you all your other videos are op oh yeah, op yeah 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 um i think maybe i just forgot to change it back i think at one point i went back and changed all of the titles in my videos that said op to, to say overpower because i realized i got a few comments like what does op mean what oh. is, you know and Did i was like oh maybe it? like people yeah maybe people thought oh they i this isn't for me because i don't know what this means um so i'll just not watch it and I figured, oh, okay, so I'll change it to overpowered and see if it changes anything. And it didn't, it didn't do anything. So uh, I just changed most of them back because I think people kind of associated the o is blank OP title scheme with me. So changing it up maybe was, would also affect things. I don't know. I don't think it really mattered in the long run either way. I think people, most people do know what it means if they're in that sort of sphere. Like if they are part of the target audience, they are going to know what it means. Mm -hmm. So whatever. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I see. So you went back, you, you scanned it and then, uh, mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah. You have, uh, I really wonder like, why do some of your videos get one or two or three and then some get seven or 8 million? Like that's so many views. It is. Like, yeah. I, don't I know. think, I think it's a just... lot of it is the watch time. Like a lot of the ones that really popped off lately have been the longer ones. Um, but for uh... example, like the, of the videos that I've uploaded within the last like three years, the ones that have gotten, you know, above 5 million views, hmm. most of them are at least 15 minutes long. You know, you have the lizard tier list, the fish tier list, the bird tier list. These are all some of my longest videos I've ever made. And those ones have, you know, 8 million, 9 million and 6 million respectively. Um, one that surprised me that blew up was the R Scorpions OP video. I don't know why that one did so well. I'm happy it did, of course, but I thought most people would be like, oh, scorpions, those are gross. I don't want to watch this video. I'm afraid of scorpions. Um, but it got 6 million views, which is more than, it's almost double my subscriber count. So, hey, okay. 
people like scorpions, I guess, or maybe it was just a really funny video or something. I'm glad, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. Yeah, I'm trying to decide. Like, maybe it's like the animal itself is interesting. Like birds. Oh, are birds OP? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, birds are cool. I want to click on it. <laughs> yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, eight million in a year is is amazing. I mean, I mean, I guess some of the other ones are kind of on pace theoretically. Like, if you get two and a half in two months, like our horses OP. Can we expect that to get? Six, seven think, million in a year? I don't think so. I think that one, let me take a look now. Let's see. Like that one, I can check the views and it's getting, it's getting almost 200 views an hour. Uh, it's getting about 5,000 a day, I guess. Mm. I, I wouldn't expect that to get, to even get another million views. Like unless I have a huge surge in my audience overall, I wouldn't expect that to really grow that, that fast. Oh, wow. I never know, you know, it could, it could just suddenly explode and have this new life. So sometimes that's how it goes. Yeah. Fascinating. I mean, 78 is, is <laughs> the sample size is so small. Um, when, uh, yeah. <laughs> when, uh, when, when can we expect the insect one? I'm aiming for this weekend. So we'll see. Uh, it might be a few days after that, but I'm putting the finishing touches on it now. I've, I've almost finished the rough cut. And then after that, it's just kind of putting on the little, bells and whistles, all little fun visual effects and sound effects, which is the fun part. So I get it done pretty quick. I don't procrastinate on that part. <laughs> so I think that'll, that'll probably be out relatively shortly. <laughs> you did a SpongeBob character to your list. How did I never see this video? <laughs> yeah, that one was, it was funny. I kind of wanted that one to do poorly because I wanted to believe that my audience was more, was actually really interested in animals. Um, and the video is still about animals, of course, but I, I don't know, <laughs> like, I was kind of like, uh, I assume this one's not gonna, like, I didn't want it to beat my other videos because I cared about those ones more, but yeah, that one did really well. And I was like, oh, well, that's weird. Um, but people like SpongeBob, so I shouldn't oh, be too yeah, surprised. Man, that's, that, that is interesting. Are, um, are the characters in Arthur animals? They are. Yeah. Uh, but Arthur is, I believe in Aardvark. Which I mean, it's funny because aardvarks don't look anything like Arthur at all. They yeah, have the... long noses and yeah, stuff, yeah. so it's kind of silly. But yeah, I think he's an aardvark. Obviously, what's his name? Foster, I think, is the rabbit, he's right? He's a rabbit. Uh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. What are the other characters? I don't think I remember any of the other characters from Arthur. I haven't seen it, in, you know, yeah, yeah. decades. <laughs> yeah, I thought a lot of them were the same animal because they all look so similar. But I, I guess, yeah. They, I mean, I thought most of them looked like people, except mostly you know i guess they're aardvarks but <laughs> they yeah like just buster was the only one who i was like oh that's not a human he's obviously a rat yeah yeah the rest of them were just kind of tan humanoids that don't have any obvious animal features <laughs> humanoids <laughs> i mean they are right like, yeah i know i know yeah it's weird it's a weird show <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah i uh well that's yeah i feel like you could do a you could do a fascinating um dive on on some of your content i i wonder um are there other youtubers that have gotten to like 3 million on 78 videos i would think so i think people have gotten even further than that um with less like um, who let let me let me look i i'm almost positive that there are a few let's see how many videos okay Look up Sam Onella Academy. He's gotten almost 4 million with mm -hmm. 61 videos. So he's doing really well. Um, wow. Like any of these channels where people are always watching, um, like the, the, big, the big Twitch streamers will like do react videos of their content, yeah. that kind of thing. Usually they have a pretty high sub to video ratio. Like Summoning Salt, the guy who makes all these speed run videos. Yeah. He's got one and a half million. He's got 54 videos. So he's doing pretty well. Oh, yeah. People um, people love these like animation voiceover videos, right? Like the right. Like, stick figure voiceover videos. Yeah. Like um, Internet historian, how many videos does he have? I bet he's doing pretty well because he makes these really long, like documentary esque uh, videos about internet culture and sometimes other. Yeah. he's He's got me beat by a mile. 42 videos, 3.8 million subscribers. So wow. Yeah. You can you can get a lot. You know, in a lot of cases, I think less is more. Um, people see a new upload and they're like, oh wow, this is this is must be a big thing because he only upload they, they only upload every so often. 
Um, so every new upload is a treat, that kind of thing. It, it is kind of nice in some ways to just be like an anonymous, uh, well, I don't know how anonymous uh, the, the Salmonella Academy is, but it mm -hmm. uh, seems like he's like pretty anonymous. He just... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we, the most you'll get is, the, oh, I think, he, I think his name is Sam. That's probably about all you'll know about him. Other than that, he's a stick figure on, uh, on a web comic. So. Like, like, and you've never, you don't know who this is, right? No, I'm, I've met him, but oh, um, oh, oh, I, oh. I figured, Aha. you know, the, the average, <laughs> you know, if you're just a, a YouTube watcher, you're not going to know anything about this. Yeah, he's guy. got like nothing. He doesn't even have a business email. You just, <laughs> That's just, go funny. His, <laughs> just go to his about. There's nothing here. Well, yeah. And then he also didn't upload for like several years. I think he, I think he stopped uploading for three years in a row and then finally just uploaded a few weeks ago. But before that um it was funny i i kind of had this in my head like i gotta i gotta beat him because at the time when i when i knew him i haven't talked to him in several years but at the time we had almost exactly the same sub count and then he proceeded to outperform me without uploading anything <laughs> wow like, how does this happen how i don't understand but i do because his videos are really funny but um yeah i was like dang this man, this man really had the secret sauce on his videos because people loved him and kept watching daily for three years, even when he was completely fell off the face of the map. Yeah, what was he doing? He just I think he was doing school, but I'm not sure. I haven't talked to him lately. Oh my god, dude, this is nuts. This is getting me inspired. Like I I'm not gonna be anonymous, but like uh I'm like, I'm pretty funny. I could get somebody mm -hmm. to like animate my my stick figure for me and 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 tell some funny stories about I don't know. Right. When I played a ten-year-old in chess. I got a bloody nose during the game. That was gross. Um, I think that's a great idea. That sounds really funny. Man, you want to you want to start like a stick figure animation channel? I'm down, dude. Actually, <laughs> I've been learning. I've been learning Blender lately, with the hope of doing some sort of 3D animation in the future. Maybe I was like, oh, maybe I'll do a story time animation channel with a 3D stick figure, that kind of thing. I think it'd be fun. Oh, that would be fun. Damn, hundred and twenty-six thousand comments. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Most I ever got was 9K, and I think it was on a video of me getting married. <laughs> uh, not Congrats on that, by the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, sometimes like people come up to me and, um, if they recognize me on the street, and they're like, yo, congrats on getting married, man. I'm like, that was like a year ago. They go, yeah. you could, <laughs> also we got more, <laughs> you know, we got more up-to-date things to talk about. Yeah. Um, no, but it's, uh, and I, I guess you haven't done like a channel face reveal, but like if people have watched enough of YouTube community, they kind of know. Yeah, I'm you, always right? the guy who pops up in person on other people's channels, but I'm mine, sorry. I'm like, no, just, I'm just a disembodied voice. So we'll see. Maybe that'll change in the future. I've got some ideas, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. For now, you know, if you want to really find what what Patch from Tears Who looks like. Gotta go elsewhere. You gotta be a real deep, you gotta be real deep into the YouTube sphere, really YouTube, <laughs> all that. That's funny, dude. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you would enjoy having people just run into you, like, let's say at your local grocery store or something, being like, oh my God, are you, you know, because like sometimes here, I'm like on the way back in the morning from coffee, a dude jogging is like, yo, and yeah. I'm like turning onto my block <laughs> and I got to do a loop just yeah, to make sure. Yeah, yeah, you got to, yeah, give him the, give him the run around. Yeah, it's nice because for me, I can kind of turn it on and off. Like if I want people to recognize me, I can just wear like merch. And, ah. you. and people are like oh yo i know that channel I'll be like yo it's me what's up man oh that's crazy um, you ever and... get recognized like face to face just by the voice no that's never no. happened no I've, I've been asked that a lot and i've had it happen in reverse where someone will watch my videos and be like mm, that sounds like my cousin patrick um so they'll recognize that but i've never had it in reverse where someone is it hears me and is like, this sounds like this one YouTube guy I watched and here's you. That's never happened. Not wait, in my entire You've life. had relatives be watching your content and be like, wait a minute, that sounds like my relative? And be yeah, like, are you? That has happened, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny, dude. Oh my God. That's really hilarious. I, uh, I've got like, I've had like people reach out. Like, I think I had a story where I was a ring boy when I was five or six years old at a wedding for like a relative. Huh. And he contacted my dad and he's like, my kids love his videos. Mm -hmm. Like the whole circle of life finished, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And like my, my mom has a person reach out, you know, uh, who, who knew my mom for 20 years and is like, yeah, you know, like my, my younger sibling, I mean, my younger son like watches it's just, and um, yeah, it's tough. Like when you got the face always there, 
Mm -hmm. you kind of you're not like a voice you're like a human being and people who know you they always like want to you know can you like wish my son a happy birthday or stuff like that and uh yeah I don't know. No, have you done that stuff like cameo or wish it you no, know no no uh, well you know what i think i had a few people message me one time on instagram saying like oh like my husband loves your channel yeah. can you wish him a happy birthday and then i would just like send happy birthday in text and that's it but I, i've never been like you know get my camera like hey you know happy birthday from you know yeah never done that that's yeah seems I, I i know it really does and then part of me is like it's free cash and then part of me is yeah. like what are yeah. you doing like come yeah. on you got your it would be hard streams. to turn down to be honest if someone's like here's a thousand dollars for you know a minute of your time that kind of thing like oh yeah what be, i think yeah. I got some short on YouTube of like Mr. Beast on some podcast and he said some billionaire offered him a quarter million. I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah, like, yeah. Mm, yeah, I'd do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everyone's got their price. Let's not, let's not be bashful. We've all, we, yeah. if you ever were in that position, let's not pretend that we wouldn't be tempted at least. I've gotten it. Yeah. I've gotten that, that inquiry so many times. It's a, uh, it's an interesting world being yeah. a, being a creator. I've gone, I've gone through the whole like journey in terms of, the last two years um i'm sure you also had that phase in your life when you were like watching ryan higa and smosh and uh and uh, or were you not because like that's what i grew up on i grew up on you know like uh, yeah for me it was uh, like smosh i i definitely watched a little bit i think the first youtubers i ever really followed like hardcore i was like dang this is like my favorite it would probably be like vsauce and vlog brothers um so I started off with like the education people. So it was cool to finally like be in that sphere, be one of them, get to meet them. But yeah, like those are the people that I really loved growing up. Um, but yeah, it's Smosh too, Smosh too for sure. So it's cool to see like Anthony Padilla still doing great with his podcast and all that stuff. But yeah. Yeah, I got a video recommended yesterday, like why Ryan Higa left YouTube or something. It was like a 15, I was just watching it in like the background while I was doing some video prep. And uh, it was just the whole story of like his career and, People in the comments were like, yeah, you know, he never went out with any drama. He just had the slow fade. And I'm like, yeah, that's so crazy, man. I mean, that's 10 cool. years, like 10, 12 years on YouTube. I feel like. Mm -hmm. I never really watched him at all. I, don't, I, I recognize the name, but that's about it. You weren't, yeah, you weren't around in the 2000 and. No, I was. That's the thing I was. But I think even then YouTube was bigger than people realize where it's like they're. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But you weren't spending your afternoons after school watching How to Be Gangster with like three of your friends and then, you know, watching him. Oh, that was him. Okay, you know, I did actually watch that. Yeah, that does ring You didn't know that was him? Yeah, like How to Be Ninja, How to Be Gangster. And he like... How to Be Ninja, yeah. I did watch that. I did watch that with my friends when I was in middle school. That's true. Yeah, like I remember crowding around our broken desktop just being like, yo, this dude is so funny. And now I'm like, yo, what? Like I have... I'm like also a YouTuber now. It's wild. I can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, because I really feel like for all we we think we have an audience, like they had the world watching them. That's like, yeah. A, and I think back then we didn't really conceptualize. I mean, at least I didn't. And I don't think my friends did. We didn't really think of them as YouTubers. We just kind of thought of their videos as like, these are really funny skit videos that we're going to come back to. But we didn't like follow their careers or anything. Like I remember watching like even before YouTube, there was, there was albinoblacksheep.com and there was a lot of really funny, goofy skits on there. Like I remember watching um, the ultimate showdown of ultimate destiny, which was probably one of the greatest like, early YouTube videos before there were YouTube videos, but I didn't like follow the guy who made that. I just saw the video and I was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm gonna show this to my friends, that kind of thing. That was, um, yeah, we, we got different. I just remembered, uh talking about all this um remember fred yeah yeah okay i guess he was probably the first youtuber who i like knew the name of yeah actually yeah i just like was googling that yeah i guess i guess yeah we we, we had slightly different forays like youtube for me was always just like a bunch of stupid goofy stuff and um i mean yeah they we're on the same page there yeah <laughs> yeah but but it, no it's really it's really incredible you could uh we could go too far down the rabbit hole of like educating yourself also, but it, it really is a place you can learn just so much and do so Absolutely. much about some yeah, facts. Yeah, I was talking about how I learned Blender recently, learned how to do 3D modeling animation. I learned all that from watching YouTube tutorials and stuff. So it's great the amount of stuff you can learn. Yeah, just, you know, don't also think that you can be a surgeon. You know, you gotta like, there's a, there's <laughs> yeah. a, there's a cutoff point. Well, it's funny because if you actually do go to med school, the way that they teach you some of the things, 
is they will send you surgery videos and you're like, here's, here it is, learn this and then do it. Like that. I remember my dad, like my dad's a surgeon and, oh, and no he, disrespect he, intended. I just, <laughs> Oh yeah, of course. Um, but I remember be, like sometimes he would be like in public watching, he would have to like kind of hide in the corner or something if he was ever in public. Cause he would be sent a video and they'd be told, Hey, learn this. Cause you're going to, you're going to have to do this. And he'd be like watching it. He'd, you like watch on an airplane or something. You have oh to like God. kind of hide it because it was like here's here's the first incision, blood, blood, guts, all that nonsense. Ooh. Yeah, I can't do that. Yeah, I would I would do medicine, but I can't stand the sight of blood. So, and me too, man. I I wanted to be a doctor before I went to college. I was like, I really want to be a doctor, and then I job shadowed a doctor, and I literally almost passed out. I like would, was feeling lightheaded and had to sit yeah. down because I couldn't do it. Yeah. So, so you don't yeah. do needles well either. No, no, I'm so bad with it. Like even getting the COVID shot, I was like really nervous whole time. Was- well, that's a that's a good note to end on because I'll I'll tell you uh, I I got my first shot. I went alone. I was like, all right, my yeah. my girlfriend at the time. Uh, I was like, Lucy, you stay home. I don't need it. I went. I'm like, I'm gonna be tough. I only okay, hate blood okay, drops. Okay, big man. Like, yeah, I'm good with vaccines, bro. It's just a little prick, you know. I sat down. And then like he stabbed me. I was like, ah, yeah, I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I sat down. I'm like, all right, let me get some water. I'm chilling in my 15 minutes. And you know, back then, like it was April, 2021. So it's like vaccine was like a huge thing. Like you had yeah. to get it. Like, yeah. And, um, I'm sitting there and the next thing I'm doing is I wake up. I fainted in you the fainted? chair. Oh, dang. Okay. And okay. I spilled the water all over myself. So it looks like I pissed myself. Like, <laughs> My whole sweats were completely no, wet. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, I might have pissed myself, but like I, I spilled the right. whole water all over myself. And oh, I was like, man. I didn't realize. So I what like I don't even know what happened. Like yeah. I blacked out. Like literally yeah. I just I remember dreaming and being like, wait, what? And I snapped out and no one noticed. Like I had just put my head down. <laughs> so you just like biffed it? Oh you you okay, you were sitting in a chair. Okay. Yeah, yeah I was sat in a chair, so I just kinda went like this. And then I like okay. sn- and I and uh like there, you know, everything was ringing and I'm like, oh, I, I, like, I think I got to use the bathroom. And that's when I got up and I realized like everything is wet. Like my bottle had tipped over spin, yeah. and I'm like, yo, this is so gross. Like, oh my God. And, um, I had to message my, I had to message like, yo, I, I don't know what happened. Like I straight up fainted and, uh, I went to the, like I, and then I got an Uber home just soaked completely. Like, um, oh yeah, I had that happen a few times when I was a little, a little kid and I got like a cut or something and I, and I would see the blood and I would get really wigged out about it. I one time fainted standing up, which is really dangerous. Yeah. Um, so don't do that if you can avoid it. But yeah, wow. I, I think the COVID shot especially uh, got me kind of, uh, it gave me a false sense of security because I had the COVID shot and I was like, that was nothing. Hardly felt it. And then I went into the, my actual doctor and got, I don't know, like the tetanus shot or something mm-hmm. like that. And that one hurt. Oh my gosh. And I was like, yo, I, I thought I was, I thought I was hardcore. I thought I could take these shots and I get this one. I'm like, Oh man. Yeah, the, the <laughs> pain really sucks. Like it's like this down. it's like this annoying like and then like the heaviness and like just the thought that you just got pierced by a needle. It just that's like know. Yeah, the more I think about it the less yeah. the, the more woozy I'll feel for sure. Yeah, yeah. And so the second time I went with my mom and I requested CVS <laughs> put cardboard down so I laid flat after I got really? this. So okay, I yeah. laid it down in observation. They were like, "Yo, what is this moron doing?" I'm just like <laughs> on my phone on the yeah, ground dude. like legs up so all the blood is going to my head yeah wow what a drama queen okay that's was, funny <laughs> yeah no i was like i'm a, and then my, my, i like went to like lunch with my mom and i felt like nice. a big big boy you know but uh look at you that shit, that shit is so bad yeah i had to get an iv once that that time i i felt like a champ like because i didn't i was good and i like doctor was like you only faint because you're nervous this and that like just breathe mm-hmm. and um yeah he was good but then it cost yeah. like four grand so yeah um, yeah. Um, well, fun times. It's a good, uh, good note to end on. Well, I was gonna normally yeah. I end these things with uh, what's next, but you already told me what's next, so I'll look forward to the insect video. Um, you do, yeah. Thank you. And uh, yeah, man, I was just, just honestly, good to catch up. So, likewise. I, I, you know, we uh, we had chess in common for a bit. Now we just have creatorship in common. Anytime you're back, uh, back in town, let me know and. Hey, you know, I'll be in New York uh, this weekend. So yeah, what? You can hang out. Yeah, no kidding. For yeah. what? You just, yeah. just just visiting Halloween party with the boys. Yeah, we're I'm getting together with some of the friends from oh. the uh, agency. So if you got plans, I don't know. I'll be there Saturday. Chess.com is flying me to Toronto on Halloween because they got some event. Okay. okay. So that's that's I mean, 
They they were like, you're not getting any Halloween parties in. You know, we're gonna we're gonna make you fly out and. All right. Uh, but there's a I, I'm sure the, I don't know what the weekend is. Maybe thirtieth. Oh shit, that's that's there you go. Oh yeah, it's like oh thirty first is a Monday anyway. Oh. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Halloween, no big deal. It's the weekend that's important. So yeah, maybe I'll see you this weekend then. Eh? You got a you got a costume? I'm thinking about it. I think I might do. Um, I've done this before. I, I would where I've done Flynn Rider from the Tangled movie, the Disney character. That one, you know, know what that is. <laughs> I got the hair. The, okay. Yeah. Um, but I also the the new Rings of Power show has a lot of people that just are you know generic white dudes with semi long hair and a beard. So it's like okay, I have a lot more options from that too. Um, oh yeah, I feel like you could do you could do a few cool. characters. Have you ever done yeah. Jack Black? Do I look like Jack Black? No, I don't know. I I'm getting out. What are you, Jack Black School of Rock? Let me hold on. Interesting. I don't know if that's like an insult, but I feel like Jack Black is pretty cool. He, he hasn't done <laughs> depending, anything. It's based on who you ask him, might be. So I don't know. I, I I think he's great, but I I I've never been told I look like him before. No, I just I'm just thinking. Oh, maybe no, nah, maybe not. He didn't even have a. He did not have a beard. All right. Well, you're not gonna shave for Halloween. That'd be silly. So, um. <laughs> anyway. Uh. Yeah. I'll. Uh, probably have this posted in in a couple weeks i have a couple uh episodes but i'll let you know obviously and um yeah man just uh just good catching up you know all the best yeah, with the video yeah. and stuff you got going on in the future awesome yeah yeah it's been cool catching up good to see you again man as always everyone thank you so much for supporting me and my content as i said in the introduction uh tears is a great guy i highly recommend his channel to all of you and there will be a little pause i think in podcast episodes to be uploaded, uh, but that's because I, I simply can't manage everything at once. But hopefully, I will see you rather sooner rather than later in Gotham City with whoever is going to be our next guest.